sugar. We think of it as that saccharine white powder that makes everything that little bit sweeter. And how can a little sweetness ever be such a bad thing? Sugar's history goes all the way back to the earliest records, but where our interest begins is in the 1600s. You can take sugar in a way as kind of telling a story of empire and colonization that goes way, way, way back into the past. Sugar makes coffee, tea, chocolate, all of those other drinks, it makes them palatable. So the, the becoming of tea as a national drink is all to do with sugar. With the entire nation looking to sweeten the national drink, demand outstripped supply, the result being... Sugar was very, very expensive in, in Europe at the end of the 1600s. Sugar's value promised huge profit for those who could meet demand. Greed would replace empathy and basic human decency, resulting in one of humanity's darkest tendencies, dominion over their fellow man, slavery. And slave ownership connects, in, in many cases, connects back to the, the sugar industry. So people from Africa, West Africa in particular, were captured and brought down to the coast. Many people died uh, along that way. This first leg, a dehumanising march that barely marks the beginning of their suffering. People then taken onto the, onto the boats, onto the slave ships, um, and the conditions were absolutely awful. Stacked like matchsticks, human beings were treated as cargo, a commodity, an object. 15 million people enslaved, and maybe something like a third of that died along the way or died on, in, the, in, that, in that middle passage. Those that survived the journey were quickly put to work on the plantations. From beginning to end, it's hard physical labour, very, very hard physical labour in, in a really hot, tropical kind of climate to the extent that the, the, the mortality was really high. So they're shipping strong and healthy young people to work in these appalling conditions and they're dying. The slave trade continued for 300 years, with millions taken from their communities. But over time, a push for abolition gained popularity. There were, were, there were celebrations when the slave trade was abolished. But there were still slaves. Whilst the British were busy patting themselves on the back, the plantations continued as normal. A change of term from slavery to indentured servitude meant little for those at the end of the whip. Cane sugar goes from being uh, a, a valuable um, item, a very expensive item, at the end of the 1600s, early 1700s, to by the, certainly by the middle of the 19th century, Victorian times, it's a kind of, it's a staple. Supply finally met demand, and the horrific truth on how an industry began was sugar-coated and minimised, becoming just one of history's less palatable footnotes. This sugar thing that we're talking about, it kind of it carries that story. Um, and it's not to say sugar's bad, but it's to say that, you know, cane sugar, that story is there within that um, lump of sugar that you drop in your tea. On the backs of slavery, an industry was built. Founded on exploitation, propped up by bondage, and enforced servitude. But how do we go from those appalling beginnings to all of these? With good old American exceptionalism. In the booming post-war American economy, advertising agencies sought to match product to customer. And when advertising to children, sugar changes everything. Capitalist America had a sweet tooth and children's love of sugary snacks was eagerly encouraged through decades of advertising that sold sugar as what kids wanted and needed. No other food gives energy faster and with only 18 calories per teaspoon. Oh, good. You love Tootsie Roll Pops. It was the 1970s that brought us snacking between meals because, I don't know if you remember, a finger of fudge is just enough to give your kids a treat. The chocolate manufacturers suddenly put into the brains of the housewives and mothers, oh, my kids are coming home from school. They need to have a snack before dinner. Milky Bar. Every bite's a luscious, chewy treat. 
Milky Way. Toast corn to golden flakes and adds a secret frosting. Helps keep them extra crunchy and delicious. It's part of your good breakfast. My husband used to have white bread, butter, and then a tablespoon of sugar. How do I love you? <laughs> By the 1970s, advertising had sold the idea that sugar-filled snacks provided all the energy children and working-class adults needed, replacing protein-rich meals. The result of this advertising is a Western diet that contains more sugar than at any point in history. Exceeding recommended amounts by so much so that something has got to give. The looming international emergency over obesity. Diabetes. Pediatric obesity. Diabetes. Obesity. Diabetes. Obesity. Diabetes. Between 1977 and 2002, the percentage of the American population eating three or more snacks a day increased from 11% to over 42%. If it's high in sugar, then it's also very high in energy. And that means that it's easy to overconsume um, diets that are high in sugar and high in fat relative to other types of diets. As of 2018, the average adult diet now contains up to three times their daily recommended sugar intake. And it's certainly the case that if you overconsume sugar, it will lead to obesity, but that's the case with any other nutrient as well. But when it's combined with a sedentary lifestyle and overconsumption, then it seems to be harmful. Sugar's link to providing energy as promoted through advertising led to one of the leading causes of overconsumption. Energy drinks that contain an entire day's intake of sugar in a 240 gram serving. Sugar in liquid form, so in your cans of um, soda, Coca-Cola and so on, that, that's probably the worst form because if you consume solid foods, then you tend to eat slightly less later on because you've already consumed something. Whereas if you consume energy in a liquid form, like a drink, then you're not so likely to compensate later on and you're still likely to eat the same food as if you hadn't consumed those calories earlier on. Enjoy refreshment on the job. It's a relaxing experience. With a third of children leaving primary school obese, health officials are now rushing to curb the amount of sugar in children's diets, pointing to the amount of hidden sugars in food. A Starbucks mocha frappuccino has 47 grams of sugar in it. A can of Coke has 39 grams of sugar in it. So an innocent smoothie, which you'd think was quite healthy, yeah? It contains, well, equivalent to three and a half donuts of sugar. Ask again, how can a little sweetness be such a bad thing? On the job. So often, that's where you want refreshment most and enjoy it most. Especially quality refreshment. Refreshment you can trust, like you trust the product you make on your job. A quality product made with the best of materials with experience and care. Here's Richard.